Yeah, we will. Um, but we will for both services. Um, I'm glad you remembered or reminded me of that. There won't be any Eastern Monday service. So it's just the two services on Easter Sunday. Hard to get back that feeling on Easter Monday that you had on Easter Sunday. is something that we do report, so, or it has been in the past, so I think it's worth it if we can. It's, it's not going to make a difference this year because it's been so weird, but, or I mean, last year, I mean, but, uh, and this year thus far, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, I don't know, but, yeah, um, today more than usual, I think. Okay, we are ready to begin, everyone. Uh, if you have your sheet in front of you, that's what we're going to be going through today, as well as any other questions or comments you might have about Abraham, about Sarah, about marriage, all of that. Let's begin with a prayer. Lord Jesus, we love to sing, sweet the moments, rich in blessing, which beneath your cross we spend. And we love spending this time beneath your cross in the shadow of your love, talking about your great gift to us of marriage, your great examples of, to us of Abraham and Sarah. And as we talk about these things, uh, lead it to uh, make our own marriages more pleasing in your sight, more of a blessing to each other, uh, our spouse and ourselves, and uh, the people around us as well. Guide us with your Holy Spirit today as we talk about these things. And in his name, in Jesus' name, we pray. Okay, so if you open up your sheet, we're still doing uh, Abraham and Sarah. Uh, technically, this is still part of part two uh, that was entitled Identity Crisis by my son. And for review, this is what we talked about, how uh, trust is such a foundational thing in marriage that without trust, you're going to have some troubles. Um, it is trust, it is through faith in Christ that we are brought into a relationship with our Father and uh, in heaven. And again, uh, trust serves as such an uh, important aspect of our marriages here on earth. When that trust is broken, um, there are challenges and difficulties. And I think we ended up by talking about uh, maybe when those trust things are, are gone, uh, one way to start rebuilding trust is through um, apology. And that's what we talked about last thing. So if trust is one foundation of a, a, a healthy marriage, then forgiveness would be another. And here's how this section is introduced. Husbands mess up a lot. Wives mess up a lot. Thank God that he gives us the ability to move past mess ups. Thank God for forgiveness. And that's the key for this section that we're talking about. We start off with some passages. Um, asking, you know, what, what is forgiveness from a biblical point of view? What's the picture from these passages of forgiveness? Okay? The first one is Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Forgiveness is a matter of what, according to that passage? Right? Removing. Removing transgressions. And not just some way, part of the way, but as far as the east is from the west. Uh, I know that I probably um, am guilty of, of repeating things a lot, so if I'm repeating this, I apologize. Um, can you figure out how far east is from west? I suppose it's like numbers, it's infinite. Um, I, I looked it up on Google because Google knows everything. Uh, but, but you can think you can determine the, the distance between east and west, at least in this sense, that the size of our universe from one side of the universe to the other. And you know, I don't remember the exact thing, it was but it was about like 80.8 .8 
and then 27 zeros behind it of miles, whatever that number is. And um, I, I, I'm not a science guy, and I'm certainly not an astrophysicist guy, but I could also imagine that that number is not a static number. Does anybody know why? At least according to theory? Big Bang Theory. Not the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Uh, what, did, what did you say? Okay, Diane said that uh, some postulate that the, the universe is continuing to expand. I, I don't know how you would prove that, uh, or maybe it's through the measure of light. I, I don't really know, but um, uh, if, if, if the universe is that big, 88.8 uh, plus 27 zeros miles, uh, then it might even be bigger than that by the time I finish the sentence, especially if I put a bunch of dependent clauses and, and uh, other things to drag it out. So, so yes, um, the, the matter of sin removing from us, that's forgiveness, removed. And, and if, if something is that far away from us, as far as the east is from the west, it's like it doesn't even exist anymore, right? It's, it's, not, even, it's not even remotely a possibility in our lives. So that's forgiveness. Removing transgression. How about the next one? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. The picture is a little bit different there. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. The picture of forgiveness there is what? And maybe, maybe start with what's the implied picture of sin? Stain. Sin is a stain, right? And forgiveness is like making us clean, right? Uh, well, getting rid of the stain of sin, well, as white as snow. Man. Cancel culture probably can't sing this anymore, right? <laughs> You're not supposed to say white anymore. Does anybody remember or can tell me if in our hymnal that, that line that I think I remember from the, the old 41 hymnal and make us white again? Um, I think it was a Lenten hymn. Is that line still there? I don't know. Uh, I can't remember uh, what hymn it is and, and uh, what verse of that hymn. But I, but I remember that line that the, the, the last line is, make us white again. If any of you guys looking through their hymnals can remember that, uh, point it out to me. Okay, so that's forgiveness, a removing of the stain of sin, the deep down stain of sin. And how about this one? Jeremiah 31, verse 34. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Forgiveness is a matter of what? From God. It's a matter of Forgetting, forgetting my sin, forgetting sin. And, and why, when we read a passage like this, Jeremiah 31, verse 34, where God says, I will remember their sins no more. Why is that so mind-blowing, mind-boggling? Because we don't get, I mean, it's really hard for us to set aside our remembering of offenses. <laughs> for one thing, we never forget when someone sins against us. Is that what you're saying? Uh, that we remember that all the time. Um, but, but I'm thinking about from a, from a theological, Christological uh, point. Go ahead, uh, Terry. From, again, the cancellation concept that you talked about in the sermon, that is just another point that the world will use and say, well, you say God is omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing. How can he forget something? Right, and that's where I was going to with that too, that uh, if God is all-knowing, omniscient, how is it possible for him to forget? Do we have an answer to that? Maybe it's just an act of his will. He decides to forget. He decides to forget our sins. That's how he treats my sins and your sins. He makes a decision to forget about them, and that's how it's possible for him to forget. Terry, an idea? Go ahead. It, it 
it's always been, it no longer becomes my sin. It became Christ's sin that he took on for me. Okay. Uh, that's another, uh, that, that's not just a picture, that's the, an actuality from the scriptures, right? Um, so, so in that sense, God forgets them because they've been placed on Christ. Got it. Uh, how does this measure up with what we always say? Uh, I shouldn't say that. We don't always say this, but sometimes we say this. I'll forgive, but I'll never forget. Have you ever heard people say that? Uh, I'll forgive, but I don't know that I can ever forget. Um, and, and, and putting the best construction on it, we are sinful people. And because we are sinful people, we are prone to hold grudges. We are prone to remember the things that people have done to hurt us and harm us. Um, but our pattern, our, our goal is always that of God. If, if God forgets my sins, maybe I can forget the sins of others. Does that make sense? I think. Okay. Uh, did we do all three of those? I think we did all three of those. Um, so what's the next thing? Um, if marriage, number two, if marriage is a song, then forgiveness must be part of the refrain and not just a single verse. I, I can tell that my son has written this. He's always making these musical allusions, um, talking about how marriage is a song. Um, and, and what does he mean with this statement? If marriage is a song, then forgiveness must be part of the refrain and not oh, just a, a verse. Molly, it repeats over and over and over again. The refrain is something that you, you sing not just one time, but you sing it over and over and over and over again. And so forgiveness is something that is needed over and over and over again in a marriage, and it should be clear why. It's real simple why that is. Why is forgiveness needed in a marriage over and over and over again? Because we keep sinning over Because we keep sinning over and over and over again. And we find new and awful ways to do it, to sin against our spouse. And that forgiveness is so key then. Okay. Um, let's uh, go to the beauty of forgiveness on the, third, the second page. And here's just a, a wide open question. Why do we forgive? Uh, Sue said, it's God's command. Is it a command of God to forgive? Yes. Remember, um, uh, and again, here's, I'm probably repeating myself, but remember that time when Peter came to Jesus and said, how many times should I forgive my brother? And was he talking his brother in a general sense or his brother in a specific sense? He had a brother who was part of the disciples, right? Who? Andrew. And so I've always tried to imagine that scene where Peter goes, how often, Jesus, should I forgive my brother? And his brother's sitting right there. Well, come on, man. And what does Jesus say? Oh, oh first Peter gives a suggestion. Up to, up to, this is the max now, seven. seven times. And Jesus says, what? Not seven times, but 70 times, 70 times, or seven times, 70 times. Whatever it is, it's, it's, a, it's a huge amount. It's an innumerable amount. You keep on forgiving him, right? Um, so in that sense, Sue is, is absolutely right. Jesus has commanded us to forgive. That's one reason. Why else do we forgive? Meg? Because he forgave us. Okay, because he forgave us, right? Uh, we forgive because the Lord has forgiven us, okay? Uh, where is that pas passage from Colossians? Be kind and compassionate to one another. Then how does it go? Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So you forgive because Christ has forgiven us. Um, not so we can give Christ forgiveness, but because Christ has forgiven us, we are inspired to forgive. Right? We are motivated and moved to forgive by Christ's forgiveness of us. All right. Um, 
do we, do we forgive, do I forgive my spouse because she's worthy of my forgiveness? I, I'll put that in a way. Does she forgive me because I am worthy of her forgiveness? No. Right? Uh, and again, our, our pattern is uh, the Lord himself and, and us. The Lord doesn't forgive us because we are worthy of his forgiveness. He forgives us why? Because of his mercy, grace, love, um, unconditional, however you want to put it. Um, and, and that's why we forgive too. Not, not because our spouse or the person we are forgiving deserves to be forgiven or is worthy of that forgiveness or is lucky to have that forgiveness, but we forgive uh, because Christ forgave us. Okay? All right. Um, so you're thinking back now to Abraham and Sarah. And, and the, the, the one uh, context story that we talked about last time that connects this whole idea of forgiveness was when Abraham and Sarah were down in Egypt. And remember what, what happened there? Who can, who can remind us of what happened there when Abraham and Sarah, because of a famine, went down to Egypt? Meg, do you remember? To get her. Right. So uh, he, he was afraid that uh, if, if Pharaoh knew she was his wife, uh, he would take that wife by force. But if it's a sister, well, have at it, I guess. Um, and that was a disservice to Pharaoh. That was a disservice to Sarah, obviously, and a disservice most of all to God. Okay. So that brings us then to the forgiveness end of it. Uh, Abraham apologized to Sarah. Now it's Sarah's turn to forgive. Pick the best way for her to say, I forgive you. Uh, let's just go through these one by one. Abram, I forgive you. I'll, I'll read them and then you comment. Uh, Abram, I forgive you if you promise never to do this again. See, Abram, I forgive you, but you shouldn't have been so foolish. D, Abram, I love you. I forgive you for making me like your sister, uh, act like your sister. I will do my best to forget your sin just like God forgets mine. Well, if you had to choose, obviously, which one would you choose? Uh, Dylan says one. Or A. I'm sure people are going to say, what are D, you have the I'm sorry talk two weeks ago. But I think D sounds too cheesy. Too cheesy? In reality, as a spouse, I'd be like, okay, that's enough. Yeah, uh, maybe that is the best way to do it. Uh, Terry, you got a comment on that? The other thing, B, C, and D are all semi-conditional on if you do something, I will continue to forgive you type of thing. D. Yes, that isn't what we're supposed to do. We're just supposed to forgive. D seems like you're throwing it in their face again. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, maybe the simple I forgive you is best. Maybe the simple I forgive you is best. Um, uh, as long as it, I suppose, doesn't just become a, a rote thing where there's no real meaning behind it. It's, it's an easy way out for you to, to smooth things over and to get back on track, I forgive you. Um, as long as it's there inside, Meg. To realize what it is that they're sorry for. Right, right. 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 I'm sorry.
Yes. Uh, it, okay. So the, the point that you, you get to is you want to say, too, I'm going to help you not to do that. But it's about him or her. It's not about your selfishness. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to remember what you did today. I'm going to help you not to not be doing that. Yes. Um, so maybe that's what Sarah was saying. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that's what she was saying with D, right? And, and maybe, uh, so maybe we, we do have to walk the fine line of, of this, just assuring uh, sincerely that we forgive a person and, and, and then maybe sometimes using our forgiveness statement as a club to beat them up some more. How about this? This is not a question, but let's say that you were... Um, advising young couples about to get married, um, and, and you, you said, I think there are five sentences that you should always remember in your marriage, that, that you want to make use of a lot in your marriage, intentionally. I mean this sincerely. Uh, what, what are five things you would want every young couple to, to remember to say to each other intentionally? Uh, Dylan, your hand up went up immediately. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I think wife also not in church. I think why is, oh, she's over there. Not here. Not here. Proceed, Mr. Johnson. I, I, you know, I'm going to take the gender out of it and just say, yes, dear. Yes, dear. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, and maybe that might smooth some, some things over, but in sincerity, what what are some what are five things you would want uh, young couples to, to be able to learn to say with frequency in their marriage? I love you. I love you. That's a good one. And why why did I say that and in, in, intentionalize it? Probably because that's easier to say when you're courting, when you're dating, when you're beginning, but you got to make it a little more intentional, right? Boy, I, I see some great, I see some great hands now. Julie, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. That wasn't on my list, but I'm going to add it now. Your spouse has your back, yeah. right? Um, okay. Did I see one over here, Howie? I, I, was think, I was thinking especially of thank you. Yes. Um, and, and thank you because um, what happens over time, it's easy to start to take your spouse for granted. And, and uh, intentionalizing that thank you is, is important. Uh, how about some of the things we've been talking about just in these last couple of lessons? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, and, and maybe that goes along, uh, I'm sorry, and maybe what goes along with that is, will you forgive me? And, uh, and then maybe the, other, maybe the other one, especially if someone says, says I'm sorry, I forgive you. I forgive you. Did, did I hear, see a hand over there no. in the peanut gallery over there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so I don't know if I had exactly five in mind, but uh, thank you, I'm sorry, uh, uh, forgive me, um, I love you, yeah. Um, maybe there's, a, there's others that you could add, but, but, but to intentionalize them, okay? All right, uh, let's keep going then. Uh, we are at a letter, uh, or number five, Forgiveness can be hard. Uh, talking can help. Complete the following sentence. When my spouse or anyone has hurt me, I should talk to my mom. <laughs> uh, who should we talk to, Lorraine? Okay. She said, talk to the one who hurt you. Absolutely. Then she added, talk to God. I, I think, yes, uh, you know, um, maybe there's, there's a third option there. Uh, talk to God in prayer, ask for the Lord's help to forgive, um, that type of thing. Uh, remind me of your great love for me, that I may be able to forgive the person who's hurt me. 
uh, talk to that person. Um, that, that can help to, to smooth things between you two, right? As you come to it with, with a humbleness and an eagerness to, to love and forgive. Um, is there a third, third option? Yeah? I would think if it's an extreme trauma, you might need some extra counseling, so your pastor or who could help you okay. gain perspective. So Don said you, you may need a third party that could help, right? Whether whoever that would be. Um, you know, a, a pastor, at least the pastors of my generation, were not trained family counselors. Um, but I, I can certainly talk to you about what the scripture says about uh, forgiveness um, and uh, uh, the motivation that you have to do that. Uh, that I could help you with. But um, uh, maybe, maybe there would be times when a third party could be helpful. Um, maybe you'd want to avoid, though, and, and you know, maybe Don, not just a pastor, but maybe a Christian friend, right? Yeah. Uh, I thought I saw a hand go up. Terry? Going on the opposite end, because this is what Satan would want us to do. Who do you not talk to? Is that what you're saying? When, when my spouse or anyone has hurt me, I should talk to everybody but them. I should talk to everybody, <laughs> everybody but them. Yeah. Or here's, a, here's another way of going the, the, the wrong direction. And I, I typically don't like to stereotype people. Uh, or maybe genders, uh, but when um, a spouse in a marriage has been wronged, hurt, and they just shut up about it, they don't talk uh, at all about it, they don't open up at all about it, um, is that more likely to be a man or a woman? I'm only speaking from my own experience. So if you caught what uh, Beth Ann said, maybe it was a generational thing that her father and her father's father, grandfather, uh, it would have been more typical for a male just to not say anything, and not, not do a whole lot about it, um, and just fest let it fester, I guess, let it grow. Um, but uh, she's also making the point that maybe more recently uh, we have uh, seen the importance of teaching uh, uh, males and females the, the good practice of expressing yourself. Is that what you're saying? Something like that. Uh, Julie. That is true. Uh, when neither spouse wants to talk about it, uh, then, then how are you ever going to move forward? And, and is there a solution? to something like that, in that kind of situation? Praying for God's help. Uh, you know, praying for the Lord's help to, to, to have those tough conversations. Uh, maybe that, maybe, maybe recognizing um, always that it's not gonna get any better unless we do something about it, that, that type of thing. Maybe getting a, a third party involved might help too. But yeah, you're right, Julie, that uh, uh, if, if, if you're in a situation where neither one wants to cut, confront the other, that's, that's a tough thing. Uh, but it's love when you do it. Okay. Um, uh, all right. So let's go to number six. Where are we at? Discuss the following passages or how the following passages are helpful when you struggle to forgive your spouse or anyone, obviously, for that matter. First uh, Peter chapter five verse eight. How are these passages helpful uh, when we're struggling to forgive someone? Be self-controlled and alert. Uh, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Uh, Molly.
Okay, and and whose fingerprints are all over that 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 disunity and the disruption and yeah and the and uh, the, the the breaking of harmony that that hap that happens with that kind of way of addressing it when everything just boils over and it's just a huge mess. Satan loves Satan does not love unity. He loves disunity. Uh, he, he does not love peace. He loves strife. And when he can accomplish strife, uh, he is very happy. So, so the, the, the purpose for this passage, I think, for being here is just a reminder that when there is conflict between husband and wife or uh, person A and person B, uh, we, we have to acknowledge Satan's place in that. That he loves... He's, he loves to drive a wedge between people. Uh, say, or I'm sorry, say. <laughs> <laughs> Diane. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I didn't mean to call you Satan. <laughs> Get me behind you. Uh, I'm sorry, Diane. Go ahead. Yes, uh, the inability to let go of something, right? Uh, and that's what it is, that, that, that bitterness that makes your life miserable, makes the people around you miserable because of your inability to forgive. Is that what you're saying, Kai? Yeah, um, and yes, um, Satan loves that, absolutely. Okay, any other thoughts? How about the next passage? Uh, Matthew 7, verse 4. Remember, these are... How are these passages helpful when we struggle to forgive someone? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? What does this passage remind me of? May? Sure that, that, that I am sinful and I need forgiveness daily as much. I daily sin much. And I, I need that forgiveness of God uh, as much as my spouse does. That, that I don't approach this whole thing of that spouse or that person having wronged me as if um, I'm better than they are. That I'm on that same spiritual level as them. Right? Okay, how about the last passage? Uh, be kind and compassionate to one another. I said Colossians, it's Ephesians, sorry. Uh, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Maybe going back to something we had said earlier, uh, where we're struggling to forgive someone, what, what, what is helpful to remember? How we've been forgiven. How we have been forgiven, right? How we, who are not worthy of forgiveness, have been forgiven. And, and then maybe that makes forgiving others a little bit easier. Okay. All right, uh, Diane, go ahead. Said. Uh, so the first thing that, that Diane said was that uh, uh, making use of please and thank you uh, helps a lot in her dealing with kids on the bus. Um, so that, that's a good, good reminder. But then also that, um, how, did, how did you put it, that when we, that, that, that we, we learn to say goodbye to those things that have hurt us. Um, and maybe that happens, maybe that it can't happen immediately, but it's, but it's not something that uh, you keep on bringing up. Is that that's what you're saying? That, that uh, yeah, yeah. I think I heard it this way, that 
some guy complaining about his wife. Um, boy, you never say this joke now. This was a joke from 30 years ago. Um, guy complaining about his wife. She's not hysterical. She's historical. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, of course, he meant was that he, uh, the, she, he can't let go, she can't let go of the history. Uh, she, she brings it up over and over again. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I, let's finish this, and then uh, we can start afresh the next time. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 12. Unless Mr. Jensen covered this last week. I don't see him here. So let's look at it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in a promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, not tents anymore that you move around, but a city with foundations, the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Uh, by faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made that promise, God himself. And so from one man, and he as good as dead, at least his reproductive abilities as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Um, okay, so what is it that this writer highlights in this section about Abraham, maybe in one word, faith, right? Uh, by faith, he was able to do these things. He was able to do these things by faith, all right? Is his faith any different than yours? I think we talked about that. No. His, his, his faith was in something that was going to happen. Your faith is in something that has happened. Uh, but there's no reason why I can't demonstrate the faith of Abraham, or you either, okay? Um, um, and from that faith flowed action, right? Uh, number two, Sarah died when she was 127 years old. She and Abraham were married for a long time. What do you get for your spouse on your 100th wedding anniversary? A wheelchair. A wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a reserve spot in a nursing home. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, any any other kinds of answers? How did they manage a wedding or a marriage that lasted over a hundred years long? How did they manage that? I, I guess the, the the simplest and most basic answer would be the one that we just gave in that first question. They managed it by faith, by their confidence and trust that the Lord would continue to take care of them and bless them by the, the confidence and trust that the Lord would continue to forgive them when they messed up in their own marriage and that letting that confidence inspire them to forgive each other in that marriage too. Okay? Uh, but that's an interesting question. What do you give someone for the 100th anniversary? Is there such a thing? What is the 100th anniversary? Is it gold? Well, that's 50. Platinum? <laughs> Titanium? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, plutonium? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the last question. Uh, we didn't, well, we don't know what Abraham and Sarah did for their hundredth. Regardless, what far more important gift did they share throughout their years together? Commitment to each other and to their marriage. Faith in the promises of God. Right? Um, and and let's, let's go back to what Don said. What, what grows from that commitment? That act of the will on your part and mine when we tell our spouse and mean it. I am yours. You are mine. That's the way it is now. That's the way it will be as long as we both shall live, and we're not going to let anything get in the way of that. What grows 
from commitments like that? Trust. Trust. What else? Love. Right. Uh, a desire to forgive. A desire for peace and harmony um, grows from that kind of commitment. Okay. Uh, yes, Beth Ann. The 100th anniversary gift is a 10-carat diamond. A 10-carat diamond. <laughs> 100th anniversary gift. <laughs> I didn't start saving up. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, I was hoping you'd have the answer to that hymn thing, but uh, that's good. Yeah, Just anyway. Yeah. Okay. Any final thoughts or comments? Thank you, everybody. Oh, Don, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it's been proven chemically within, with inside your body that when you are a forgiver, you're healthier. I mean, like when, when King David, too, when, you know, when the sin is in there festering, you is, is there a, a, a physical reaction yes. when you hold stuff in? A physiological reaction inside so you, of you? So you will physically be healthier if you are a person of forgiveness. Yeah. Um, boy, I, at least I know, at least in the psalm, which psalm was it where David was talking about how when he held all of that in, he was sick um, and he didn't feel good. Uh, and that type of thing. So, so uh, your relationship with God and with others can have a toll on your physical health. So. Say it anyway, Marie. Okay. I don't have a husband right now. He doesn't have a wife. We're probably in the wrong life. Just about. I'm 50. Are you learning nothing today? Oh, so, okay. If you heard her, she said, yeah. We're not talking about a husband and wife. Uh, they're, they're not in a husband-wife relationship. They're in a uh, mother-son relationship. Can some of this apply? Absolutely. Absolutely. It really, it's any kind of relationship that you're in, right? Yeah, it doesn't, it's not limited to husband and wife. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. We're glad you're here. Anything else? Let, uh, let's close with the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us always. Amen. Enjoy the day. And when do you